Welcome to another episode of the Startup Lantern. Bruce and I are in person today in Vail, Colorado, and we're really excited to have a live guest join us for our show. We're looking forward to sharing some new insights with you on challenges some real entrepreneurs have had as they've started their own business. So join us today for another episode of the Startup Lantern. Welcome back, everybody. We are on site this time for the first time in 19 episodes. Uh, and we're joined today by Carl May, who is uh, with Join Digital. And he's going to be talking about you know, his experiences going through startups. Welcome to. Thank you very much. Good to, uh, good to see you both. John, Carl, good to see you. Carl, tell us a little <clears throat> bit about Join Digital. So Join, uh, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of the company. Started almost six years ago, five and a half years ago. Uh, the vision was to deliver uh, enterprise branch and campus networking services, very much like Amazon Web Services. The idea was we could d deliver these as a, as a complete, uh, as a service. Uh, we built our own technology stack from the ground up, um, from the hardware up to the software. Uh, and uh, we now have about 150 or so Fortune 1000 clients. Uh, mostly in North America, a little bit in Japan, and, and a little bit in Europe. Um, so that's uh, that's what we've done. So this isn't your first rodeo, I'm imagining. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I don't have my I don't have my uh, cowboy boots on, but this is not my first rodeo. I started my very first company in uh, 1990, and that was actually strangely enough. I guess this means has to, this has to be my last company. That was actually a branch routing company. So if you, if you go back to the early days of routing, when most of the telco services, I mean, most of the connectivity services were really telco services. Um, and, and back in 1990, the enterprise local area networks were these companies that nobody's ever heard of anymore. You know, Novell maybe, but Artisoft, Banyan, Banyan Vines, Wollongong, uh, Ungerman Bass, all these other you know, all these other enterprise, uh, these, the, the smaller branch names office. Names no longer exist. <clears throat> names that no longer exist. Yes, but you're firing synapses with me that are just exactly. <laughs> going to go to sleep with nightmares. <laughs> well, well, okay. That's, I, I can get you a pill. Uh, so the, the um, but what we did is we built a company that started off with really the, so we, we were providing both the routing and we uh, integrate, you know, we were, we were really doing the routing Across, I think about initially about seven or eight of the of these of these land types, and it was a very successful. It was a pretty pretty successful business at the time. Uh, we sold out in '93, and then and I started I guess four or five more companies since then. So you got the bug, is what you're saying? Yeah, I I got the I got the bug. It it probably has more to do with the fact that uh, I have ideas. Most of them are pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but I have lots of ideas, and I think about something, I meet somebody, and I say, well, you know, maybe I can solve that problem a little bit differently. And I realized after the first time and the second time that I could formulate a, um, you know, formulate a plan, uh, figure out how, to, how best to, to um, fund the company. I, I really like the ideation, growing the company to, you know, a certain size, and then ideally, Handing it off to somebody else to grow it further. Have you had a tendency of uh, going to the same uh, venture organizations over and over? Or? Great question. Um, in the early, early days, you know, starting sometime around the, the global financial crisis, there was a giant sea change, a, a, a huge change in the venture world. And so before then, from the early 90s until 2000 ish, or so 2004 maybe even, um, <clears throat> I've worked with the same. The same investors, and then one of my investors got on, you know, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal saying, "Venture venture capital's dead; it's never coming back." Um, you know, and and it's like, oh, well, I, I wish they'd let me know they were going to say that. So that's a headline that didn't age well, I'm imagining. It, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't age well even right then, but but hasn't aged well to this day. And so, consequently, I've and and as I got um, more experience. 
I also had a better appreciation for the types of investors that I wanted with me. And so for instance, I did a company where all of the capital, every penny was strategic. <clears throat> and even for, for join, all of the Series A was done with financial investors, but Series B was all strategic partners that were both strategic capital as well as bringing us, you know, bringing us to market, you know, helping us expand our go-to-market. The, the, the hardest things really to solve early on are how do you find the right people, and then how do you find the really efficient go-to-market um, approach. Capital is actually not that hard to find. I mean, you, you know, it depends. But if you can't find how you're going to first win, you know, win your first customer and your second customer, your third customer, and then at some point you've got to be able to accelerate, it, it's, you know, you should just do something else. And for people uh, <clears throat> keeping track at home, he just ticked off two of the three P's that we've been repeatedly talking about, the personnel and the plan. Oh, yeah, really? Okay. You, yeah, so... Yeah, congratulations, you're, Hi, you're, you're going right well, well into our, uh, our previous okay. episodes. I, I want to dig a little deeper. You, you just uh, mentioned something else that's another one of our topics, which is you made a choice on exactly which funding sources to go sure. after. What are maybe some of the gating factors that would, would help someone else decide which for funding sources to pursue or particularly which venture capitalists to use <clears> or not use? Well, I think so that's, a, that's a great and actually a rather challenging question nowadays. <laughs> If you go back to 1990 when I, when I did my first deal, the, the big difference was there, there was actually a relatively small number of venture capitalists. And, and there was venture capital in Boston, uh, Route, well, Route 120 was mostly where it was. Obviously, Sand Hill Road was already well established as, as where all the, you know, most of the action was. You had Clyde Perkins and Sequoia and maybe, I actually, there wasn't even a benchmark back then, but you had Kleiner Perkins Sequoia, NEA, you know, Dick Kramlick. You had these other firms that were Mayfield, uh, Moore Davidow. There were others that were still around. It was a relatively small group, and, and uh, we all had a number of connections together. I, my first job was at Hewlett Packard. A lot of the VCs actually <clears throat> had, spent, had their first jobs at HP, so it was like, oh, well, I know how hard it is to get hired and okay, you seem to be not entirely dumb, so yeah, we'll back you. <laughs> but you know, today for I tell I tell founders and I I when somebody is crazy enough to ask me a question, I'll answer it. There is there are so many sources of capital that what you really need to do is figure out what do you want. So remember that when you go to a venture capitalist, I mean especially the top tier venture capitalist, they are typically going to be very deeply involved in what you do. So if this is a new experience for you, if you've never run a company before, if you don't, if you don't know how to open a bank account, you don't know how to incorporate, you don't know what law firm to use, you don't know any of that, <clears throat> those are all the things <laughs> those are all the things that a VC can be it can be great great for. I use I'm using the same lawyer, I use the same law firm probably now for 18 years. Uh, it's the same partner. He's just gotten a hell of a lot richer, uh, you know, thanks to tra you know transaction fee, you know, whatever he's made. But um, but you know, as you as you evolve, then you have different challenges. And so for me, by the time I started Velo in two thousand and nine, <clears throat> the challenge wasn't wasn't raising money. Um, the challenge was we were bringing something brand new, maybe not so fresh, but brand new to the market. And how do you, how do you, you know, pave the way to adoption? And paving the way to adoption, we decided, was to embed in, uh, in a big established company's solutions. And so we, we aligned everything we did along that path, and they wrote us a giant check <laughs> And they then got us within the first, I don't know, you know, two, three quarters, they probably got us 20 million in sales and <clears throat> of, of new customer opportunity. And so, I, you know, we made that decision. So, you know, my advice to, my advice to the, my advice to the first time entrepreneur is, is start with the best, uh, the highest quality investor you can get, you know, venture capitalist, 
Um, <clears throat> and by the time you do it the second time, what you really care about is, do we get along, right? And by the way, personality sitting around the board table is a, is a really big issue. By the time you get to my age, you, I become part of the problem. I'm, 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 I am, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the problem, so I, I have to, you know, and I recognize that. And so, again, for the first timer, the, the key thing is find, a, find an investor that, is, that understands what you do, understands what your, what your, what your market is, uh, brings more than a check. My, my, my typical view is if an investor is really just the money, you're, especially for that first time, you're, you're probably not going to be terribly well served by the relationship. Ideally, you want to find somebody who actually has real operating experience. My, I'm very biased. Uh, I, I will say that up front. I, I've, I've sat on probably 20 boards, and when I sit on the board with somebody who graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Business School or, or Stanford GSB, but has never hired, fired, restructured, uh, had to cut payroll, had to you know, lay people, you know, whatever it might be. And by the way, firing also means for performance, not just because you, you know, you need to save money. Um, then that, that's a, I think that's a, that's a real problem. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm really, really experienced at hiring, firing, <laughs> laying off, sadly. Uh, that's the only sad one, really. Um, but you really want somebody who's, ideally, you want to have at least somebody on your board who's got that experience and can talk about it. The next thing, and, and then, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but so that's the VC view. It's also really helpful early on to get angel investors that understand what you're doing. We probably have eight uh, early stage angel investors. They were experts in the field. They've opened doors for us. I, I joke, one of them has probably generated more leads than, than our entire sales organization. Um, Smart money. <clears throat> and we bring those people in. We created a, an advisory board that then evolved to a customer advisory board once we had real customers. Really what you're doing as a founder, whether you stay on as CEO, which probably I should not have, um, but whether you, whether you stay on as CEO or not, is you're really building a community around the company. And what you need to do is you need to cultivate all those relationships accordingly. And that's, in my view, that's how you really build a successful, uh, successful business. Uh, part two to a question I asked earlier on, because it sounded like you have worked with some of the same VCs over, in, but then there's oh, a yeah, great ship. <clears throat> but you know, you just brought up angel investors, and it sounds like those you might have had a little bit you know, more of a relationship with over more organizations. Is that true, or? Yeah, I mean, actually, the angel investors. Yeah, it, it's not exactly always the same angel investors. I mean, a lot of the angel investors. Um, in the early days, so for Provectus, ironically, a couple of the early angel investors were, were ex-CIA people. I have no idea how they got the money they had. <laughs> you know, it's like one of those don't ask, don't tell things. And, um, but, but it was, yes, and it was former colleagues from Hewlett Packard who put a little bit of money in, but I wasn't raising a lot back. It was a quarter of it, you know, $250,000. But then <clears throat> when we got to when I got to later companies, I, I didn't want to take people's money just because they had a lot and, and were useful advisors. There also had to be a bit of a fit, right? You, you want to have somebody who, who understands what you're doing. And so I think I, I, it, it has changed over time. I just started a company less than a year ago. Um, <clears throat> it has nothing to do with join. It's in a very, it's, or, it's orthogonal to everything else. But we had to go out and find a completely different advisory board. We have a, what's interesting is that we've got 45 insurance companies right now. In fact, we just had meetings over the last couple of days, or the founding team has, but, the, but they're, they're, um, they've got 45 insurance companies that all want to invest. It's like, well, so they each want to invest between 500,000 and a million, and we're only going to raise 2 million. The math's hard, so then we have to figure out who's the, you know, who are really the, the right ones that are going to help us develop the business. So that I think is the, <clears throat> that I think is a, um, uh, you know, you want to you want to build that community that enhances the value of the company. 
it, it should not be random or willy-nilly. I, well, actually, I think we can pretty much close it out. This is sure. fantastic. I think right. one of the things I've heard, Carl, is that through your career, <clears throat> um, I mean, many of the entrepreneurs I, I suspect that are watching our series here may be virtual unknown. So they're having to build some of these communities. They're having to develop their name. Um, a wise person once told me, you know, we've always heard it's who you know. A wise person once told me it's really not who you know, it's who knows you. And yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You building out your, your Rolodex of contacts over the years and really developing that into the, the teams that have supported you through multiple startups is, I think, our dream and hope for everyone watching this series that it won't just be one and done. They'll start <clears> a company, <throat> they'll uh, get yes. bit by the bug, and they'll continue to roll right back into that again and again. And, and I'm really excited about that. I know you've had a, a very great history, long history, and, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, we appreciate you joining us. Oh, 33 our years, yeah. So, um, again, thanks for joining us for the Startup okay. Lantern. My name is John Duran. Uh, I am one of the uh, co hosts for our show. And I'm Drew McFarland. And again, you know, we're trying to build a community here. So, if you have any questions, uh, we'll try to get them uh, over to Carl, but uh, you know, we'd be happy to answer them as well. Uh, if you find this valuable, please like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on the Startup Lantern.